Populist candidate Jair Bolsonaro beat the leftist candidate in the first round of voting in the Brazilian elections. The second and final round takes place this weekend. And to discuss it, I was delighted to be joined by Felipe G. Martins. He's a political analyst specialized in forecasting and a professor of international politics. He's worked at the U.S. Embassy in Brazil, and he is the director of international affairs of PSL, which is Bolsonaro's party. First, I asked Felipe to explain how the political and economic situation in Brazil over the last 10 years helped fuel the rise of a populist candidate like Bolsonaro. Yes, we uh, should go uh, way back than 10 years ago, but I know we, we have a little bit of time. So uh, going back 10 years ago or maybe 20 years ago, all we had was the left. So we didn't have any conservative movement in Brazil. We didn't have any right wing party in Brazil. We didn't have any right wing politician in Brazil. We had Bolsonaro, we had some other guys, but they didn't have a clear identity. And that's due to the uh, military di dictatorship. So they, uh, the left used the dictatorship to shame the conservatives, to shame uh, the political right wing in Brazil. And for decades and decades, all we had was a, a, a contest between leftists. We had PT, Partido dos Trabalhadores, the Workers' Party, and uh, in, in the other case, uh, PSDB. PSDB stands for Social Democrats, but both of them uh, used to act on the culture, uh, on media, to advance the, the diversity, the progressive agenda, so we didn't have any representation of the Brazilian right wing. And in the same time, we had a, a very, very conservative population. So our population is still very Catholic and Christian. We have a people that uh, are against abortion, against gay marriage, against uh, socialism, but they didn't have any representation. And uh, in the same time, we had a lot of corruption. So the political class here in Brazil and the entire establishment, the media establishment, the academia, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, edito editorial shop, they all are uh, leftist and very corrupt. So for a, a long time, we didn't have any voice. Uh, and when we had the internet, so we start to work uh, uh, on critics and we start to work uh, on means of fighting the left. And here we have to mention a guy that was key for what's going on right now in Brazil, that's Olavo de Carvalho. Olavo de Carvalho is uh, a professor, a philosopher of thousands and thousands of Brazilians. And he uh, can, can, we can say he is the father of the Brazilian conservative movement. So before Olavo, we didn't have anything like a right wing, even Bolsonaro and his children, uh, say they, 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 they uh, came after Olavo and they, uh, they backed Olavo's ideas. And that's, uh, that's why uh, we, we are now having all this enthusiastic about your work and the work uh, some other guys do in the US and uh, in Great Britain and also in Europe. So uh, we have a, a lot of demand for change and also for a creation of a conservative party that is now underway. Uh, PSL, uh, the party, um, a director of uh, international relations, and also the party of Bolsonaro, has elected 52 uh, deputados, 52 congressmen. Uh, and before that, uh, in, in the last election, we only had one. So we went from one deputado, one uh, congressman, uh, to 52. And that's a big part of the story that's going on right now in Brazil. Now, the Western media portrayal of Bolsonaro is of this horrendous right-wing military figure who hates women and gay people. In fact, there was a big article in The Guardian on Thursday by Noam Chomsky and other intellectuals saying that Bolsonaro threatens the world, not just Brazil's fledgling democracy. They even claim his supporters were behind 70 violent attacks after the first round of voting. Just how far removed is the Western media portrayal of Bolsonaro from reality? Well, I would say it's as far from reality as it can be. Bolsonaro is none of those things uh, the corrupt media and the establishment media has been calling him. He's not a dictator, he's not a, an authoritarian figure, he's not a homophobe, he's not a bigot, he's none of those things. So uh, uh, I would say he's indeed a threat, but not a threat to democracy. Uh, uh, you, as you know, he had an attempt of assassination. He suffered an attempt of assassination, an attempt on his life perpetrated by a left-wing wing activist. 
uh, on the eve of Brazil's Independence Day, uh, I, I believe has signaled that the crime, crime syndicate that has been running the country is in panic mode. So he's a threat to the crime syndicate. Uh, and his popularity, as, as you might have, have been seeing, he's uh, being received, received, received in airports by huge crowds. Uh, every time he goes on the streets, he, he's also received by huge crowds. Everywhere he goes, he's followed by a huge, huge crowd. And that's due to his fight on crime, his fight against crime. His stance is to fight crime along uh, its whole spectrum from everyday crimes such as street robbery and rape, organized crime, which uh, here in Brazil includes dr drug trafficking with all its linkings to uh, terror, uh, terror networks and other, other criminal uh, organizations worldwide. So uh, here we have PCC, uh, Primeiro Comando da Capital. It's like the first command of the capital, the first command of Sao Paulo, it, it will be. So it's a very organized crime organization <clears throat> that has links to Hezbollah, Hamas, and a lot of Islamic uh, terrorist groups. And <clears throat> uh, Bolsonaro has, uh, has promised to, to face PCC and also CV, Comando Vermelho, the Red Command. So the Red Command, uh, the, name, the name, name gives an idea on the ideological stance of those uh, criminal organizations. They are linked to PT, they are linked to Hezbollah, they are linked to uh, crime worldwide, and that's why <clears throat> the media has uh, saying Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro is a threat. He's not a threat to democracy, he's not a threat to uh, minorities, he's a threat to organized crime, to the crime syndicate. Now we have this absolutely staggering statistic, 63,880 people murdered in 2017 alone in Brazil. Bolsonaro's promised to deal with this. He's been called an authoritarian. He's been accused of introducing a police state or wanting to at least to handle this. Is this massive spike in murders a, a more recent phenomenon? Or has it been a problem in Brazil for a lot longer than that? No, oh, so if you get the statistics, you'll see uh, the, the murder rate uh, is getting higher and higher uh, alongside with PT's rise to, to, to the power. So you have to see that uh, it was a systematic uh, a a, a systematical view from the left that criminals sh should not be punished. So they uh, use the... the uh, judicial system, they used uh, also uh, the politicians to protect crime. And that's, uh, that's, that comes from, from the links that PT has with the FARCs. Uh, are you familiar with the FARCs in uh, Colombia? So PT found, founded a Forum de São Paulo, Foro de São Paulo. Uh, it's São Paulo's Forum. It's an organization created uh, in the words of Lula, uh, our former president, to uh, Build in Brazil what was lost uh, in Brazil and Latin America to build in Latin America what was lost uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. So uh, it was built uh, between 19 and uh, 1991, 1992, and the idea was we need to rescue uh, communism from uh, what was left in, in the Eastern Europe. So the idea was to connect all uh, all, all the organizations be it parties or even criminal organizations in Latin America that was uh, aligned with communism ideology. So uh, it, it was put forward by Lula, by Fidel Castro, by Hugo Chavez, and a lot of fellas here in Latin America that had the same idea to, to build here a, a huge country that would unite Venezuela, Brazil, uh, Cuba, uh, all those countries uh, putting forward uh, uh, a communist ideology, a socialist ideology, to, uh, uh, in the end, uh, go after the U.S. and defeat the U.S. So it was uh, 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 Lula's dreams, uh, Fidel Castro's dreams, and also Hugo Chavez's dreams. And with this link to the FARCs and other criminal organizations, they uh, made always, uh, uh, they built a system to protect criminals here in Brazil. And so they, they got to power and uh, criminal uh, uh, murder rates, also rape, robbery, uh, they just exploded. And that's part of why Bolsonaro is so strong and so popular here in Brazil. Now that's interesting that you mentioned the rape rate exploding and Bolsonaro having a plan to deal with that. Because of course he's portrayed in the Western media as this 
gross misogynist, this woman hater. In fact, there was a comment he once told a congresswoman in 2014, I wouldn't rape you because you're not worthy of it. That was his comment. But then again, 42% of women intend to vote for him. So how do we explain this supposed uh, portrayal of, of Bolsonaro as this gross misogynist when he has relatively large female support still? So starting by the, the, the declaration that he would not rape uh, that woman because she didn't deserve it, they were actually arguing. Uh, she was protecting a guy that just uh, had raped, raped a, a girl, uh, like uh, uh, an entire week. Uh, the guy spent raping the girl, and then he cut he cut uh, her her head off. And Bolsonaro was saying that that guy should go to jail. And the other the other uh, congressman was saying, no, he doesn't need to go to jail. He's just a kid. He didn't know what he was doing. The guy was 17, if I'm not mistaken. And then Bolsonaro was uh, was arguing with her, and then she called him a raper. And then uh, uh, he, he said, no, I, I, I'm not a raper. And if I was a raper, I would not rape you because you don't deserve it. Now, that's an absolutely fascinating example of how the Western media completely strips out the context. Because all we've seen in the Western media is this quote, on its own with zero context, I wouldn't rape you because you're not worthy of it. They don't tell you the backstory, which you just explained, that he's literally wanting to prosecute a rapist. He's responding to an insult, the congresswoman calling him a rapist, which is a far worse insult. None of that context ever appears in the Western media when they use this quote to smear Bolsonaro as this evil woman-hating misogynist. That's just an absolutely fascinating example of how much they hide, how they strip out context how they strip out meaning to demonize people for these kind of comments. And on that subject of comments that may be being taken out of context, there's another one about minorities, which is apparently Bolsonaro said, quote, minorities have to bend down to the majority. The minorities should either adapt or simply vanish. He was talking about indigenous lands in the Amazon rainforest, and this is another big controversy or criticism of Bolsonaro that apparently in Time magazine reported on this recently as well. He wants his business associates or he wants to pave a highway through the Amazon rainforest. How accurate is that criticism? Yeah, uh, so when he talks about minorities, he's not saying he will... Uh, uh, that, that, that quote is very strong too. Uh, the minorities have to bend, bend down to the majorities. But what he's saying actually also has a context. So uh, when he say that, he, uh, he said there, there's a basic point that no minority has a strength in its own. All its strengths come from the dominant class. Uh, so uh, what, what he was saying is diversity paradise is the absolute and unstoppable power of the dominant class and the perfect tyranny. What he was saying basically was uh, the minorities here in Brazil uh, only has, uh, have power when they are backed by billionaires such as George Soros, such as uh, some of our own billionaires here in Brazil, also by the establishment media. And he, what he was saying was our conservative values, the Brazilian values, needed to be respected. They need to be, uh, 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 they, they, need, they need to have a place in public debate because as I was telling you earlier, there's no place for conservatives in establishment media. It's not even like in the US where you have Fox News uh, and other channels. We, uh, don't have any channel here that gives space to conservatives such as myself, such as Olavo de Carvalho, such as Bolsonaro. We have to go to the internet, the social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. We don't have any space uh, on, on, public, uh, on establishment media. So uh, what he was saying was we need to respect the values of the majority. We have 91% of the Brazilians are Christians. Uh, and you don't have any Christians uh, in, in, in the media, in the academia, in any of those establishment, uh, establishment, uh, uh, establishment powerhouses. So uh, what he was saying basically was, we are going to respect the minorities, we are going to protect the minorities, as, uh, uh, protecting them from violence, from crime, but we need to respect the values of the majority. That, that was the basic point he was make, make, making there. Now, Brazil, obviously, being a Catholic country, basically outlaws abortion. It's still allowed in cases of rape or whether there's a risk to the life of a mother. 
But recently the Supreme Court said they would consider allowing elective abortions up to 12 weeks of pregnancy. What's Bolsonaro's position on abortion? Uh, Bolsonaro, uh, uh, as the, the entire population of Brazil, is very against abortion. So we have like... Uh, 95% of Brazilians are against abortion, but the uh, progressives uh, try to push it with a lot of Soros money. Uh, you know, we have a big pro pro-life movement here in Brazil, linked to Catholics, linked also to evangelicals. But not only evangelicals and Catholics are worried about abortion here in Brazil. We have a lot of atheists. We have a lot of people that are not even religion, uh, uh, doesn't even have a religion, and that is uh, are worried about abortion here in Brazil. Soros has been uh, uh, putting a lot of money here in Brazil, not only uh, to push abortion, but also to push, uh, uh, as we call here, the gender ideology, the gender uh, theory, uh, pushing that on schools, pushing that on universities, pushing, pushing that on media, and we are reacting to that. That even led uh, uh, Jorge Soros himself to complain about Brazil. He said, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on in Brazil, but people there are, are, are making dangerous movement, uh, movements, as he, he called it, because he didn't, uh, he didn't, he, he didn't make any success uh, in pushing abortion, pushing the gender ideology, and he uh, even, uh, he even uh, complained about that. So we have some of our... Uh, judges from, from the Supreme Court that are very linked, uh, are very linked to Soros, and they, w they they were put there just to push abortion. So so they are trying to uh, use ju judicial activism to uh, approve abortion here in Brazil to make it right for women to to uh, abort. But uh, no one wants that here in Brazil. So we, we could say it's more of a globalist agenda than a Brazilian progressive agenda. Now, there's this other big controversy in Brazil, which I've read about, which is sex education for children. Obviously, I'm of the opinion children shouldn't be having any sex education, at least until the age of, what, 12, 13, 14. Reports that children as young as three and four have been given or taught propaganda about alternative sexual lifestyles. Tell us about this controversy. Yeah, so the, the perversion and the dumbing down of our kids is a big topic here in Brazil. Not, not only the perversion, the sexual education to children like three years old kids, four year old kids uh, receiving in school what we uh, got nicknamed here as uh, gay kids. Bolsonaro was also very known uh, uh, when he was fighting the kid to gay, how, how we call here. It was actually a, a set of movies. Uh, that target, targeted uh, children uh, as, as young as three years old, four years old, and try to teach them that uh, gay sex was okay, but not, not, not only saying that, oh, you should respect it, you should do it. So they have like cartoons showing kids how to do uh, gay sex and things like that. So it was a big, big problem here. Uh, the, 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 the language they, they used were, were uh, targeted at those ages. So uh, it was a big scandal here in Brazil. Uh, fathers, parents w uh, went, went to the streets. Bolsonaro went to the Congress and ma made a lot of speeches. And then they canceled all that. But they still push it, uh, like hiding a lot of teachers that are aligned with the PT, uh, the PT crowd. They, they uh, take that to, to the classroom. And Bolsonaro has been denouncing that since uh, forever. But it's not only not only the sexual education; it's also the gender education. So they try to push uh, to push the idea that kids uh, kids are not born uh, women or men. They are not born male or female. They have to choose that uh, when they, they 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 reach a certain age, like 18 years old. 20 years old. So that's another big fight we have here. Uh, and also the dumping down of our kids. Uh, if you get the statistics, we are not only killing our people, you got there, the, the murder rate is like 7,000 in the last year, and, but also we are dumping down our kids. We are dumping down our people because uh, if you get like the PISA test that tests uh, our capacity to, to read, to write, to do basic operations in mathematics, we are like in the last, in the last, uh, the last group. So like uh, with countries that are much, much more poor th than we are, 
uh, and that's a big problem here too. And Bolsonaro uh, is promising to fight that too. Uh, and that's a, a, a other a, a one other mo- motive why he is also. Uh, very popular here in Brazil. Now, expanding this out into the wider conservative movement in Brazil, BuzzFeed, of all people, not a right-wing organization by any stretch of the imagination, had an article this week entitled YouTubers Will Enter Politics and the ones who do are probably going to win. I went on these channels of some of these YouTubers. They built up massive audiences, in one case over 2 million subscribers. Some of them have actually now moved into positions of power this is the MBL movement and a guy called Arthur Mame Fale. They've had such massive success based off of social media and YouTube. Tell us how that happened. Okay, so that, that has to do uh, with this, the, the history of the conservative movement here in Brazil. Uh, as I told you, Olavo de Carvalho was the first one to create uh, uh, a conservative uh, identity for Brazilian conservatives. He was not only uh, coping, uh, he was not, not, not only uh, mimetizing American conservatives, British conservatives, he was creating uh, uh, his studies, his ideas, and spreading these ideas uh, between, uh, among young, young people. A lot of them went to, the, to YouTube, a lot of them went to the streets, and MBL got, got in the story uh, right there. Uh, so in 2014, we had a huge, huge uh, electoral fight between PT and the opposition. Uh, and the, the uh, PT used uh, a lot of uh, dirt money, crime money. And when the elections were over, people got to the streets and start, uh, starting pro- started protesting. Uh, asking for Dilma, Dilma Rousseff's impeachment. And one of the movements that w- was created there was MBL, that is uh, uh, Brazilian, uh, Brazilian uh, liberal Brazilian movement. So liberal here uh, doesn't have the same meaning as the US. So we are talking about uh, classical liberals. They are classical liberals. They defend uh, free market economics. They, they defend uh, the ideas of Milton Friedman and also uh, other uh, economists such as Mises and M- MBL got, got in the story right there. In 2014, they created a big movement uh, alongside us with other movements such as uh, Vem Pra Rua, uh, Revoltados Online, and a lot of other movements that uh, uh, asked for Dilma's impeach- impeachment. And she got impeached uh, like in 2016. So MBL uh, used YouTube and the social media to channel its message. And two, uh, two guys, uh, Mamãe Falei, that, that is like mother, um, I'll, I'll tell them, uh, that, 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 that's what that, that means. And Kim Kataguiri got, got elected, they had a big vote. And I believe they, they are part, part of this larger movement. They are not part of PSL, they are not part of Bolsonaro's party, but now in the second round they are uh, throwing all their support uh, behind him. But I, I wouldn't say they are the, the, the main characters here. Bolsonaro is sure, surely uh, the largest character. Uh, all his uh, supporters, like 52 of them, uh, got elected. We uh, even joked that uh, Olavo de Carvalho uh, has uh, has been doing a lot of uh, Google Hangouts with some of these candidates, and uh, each one of these candidates that uh, has done a Google Hangout with Olavo de Carvalho uh, got elected. So uh, uh, YouTube and social media was a big part of, uh, of what's happening here. Now, another issue impacting the Brazilian election has obviously been social media censorship. Again, Bolsonaro, an absolutely huge army on social media, on Facebook, on WhatsApp, where they're very popular in spreading their message. I call it election meddling when these big social media giants, these big corporations ban and censor people under the justification of preventing election meddling. They're the ones actually doing it by banning these influential people. Tell us about the problems you've had that the Bolsonaro campaign has had over this recent few weeks with social media censorship. So from time to time, we get our accounts blocked in Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, even Bolsonaro's children they, themselves. Uh, one of them is a senator, and he, he got his WhatsApp blocked. He, he also got his Twitter blocked. Uh, Olavo de Carvalho got his Facebook blocked by like 30 days uh, running uh, on, on elections. So it was a big platform for his ideas, a big platform for uh, the defense of Bo- Bolsonaro's platform. 
uh, and uh, he, he was just blocked. And then we complained. We went to the streets, and Facebook said, "No, we can't do anything. He's spreading fake news," and they didn't have any, any, any evidence on that, any proof that he he had shared fake news. Uh, he he doesn't share fake news, but uh, they blocked him. They blocked uh, Bolsonaro's children. They blocked myself uh, in Twitter and a lot of other accounts. So. Uh, the censorship we, we are facing is huge because, uh, as I explained to you earlier, we don't have any space uh, in traditional media, in establishment media, and we uh, put all our ideas and all our our, uh, our time and work in social media. But social media like Facebook, Twitter, uh, and also YouTube uh, has been uh, trying to to uh, block block us in every single way. So uh, I would say if we had any meddling, it would be from those large companies, the big tech that that, that are blocking are blocking uh, Bolsonaro supporters. Now, of course, Bolsonaro is in prime position to win this election in the final round of voting on Sunday. What do the latest polls say about his chances? And then, how does this bode for the wider populist movement in terms of it expanding across South America and also globally? Sure. Uh, the polls are great. Uh, even uh, in the first round, Bolsonaro has said he would have won if it w- was not for the frauds in, in the le- uh, digital polls. Uh, so we have uh, a very problematic system here in Brazil. I used to work for the electoral court, so I'm very familiar, familiar with the process. It's not transparent at all. Uh, the Brazilian uh, population doesn't trust, uh, doesn't trust uh, those polls and Bolsonaro has said, oh, if there wasn't uh, any kind of meddling, any kind of fraud, uh, I would have won in the first round. And we believe it, it, it's true because we have a lot of videos and uh, uh, and uh, other uh, other proofs that there there was uh, some uh, at some extent some fraud. Uh, for the second round, Bolsonaro is clear the favorite. He has something like 6% against 4% uh, of Adagi, Fernando Adagi, his contender. Uh, and uh, I believe he, he will win. In 2016, I, I wrote a piece saying uh, the second round would be between Bolsonaro and Fernando Adagi. And people say, no, Bolsonaro won't, uh, won't be there. He, he, he doesn't have money, and he doesn't have money. He doesn't have a party, and he indeed doesn't have a party. He doesn't have any kind of political support, and indeed he doesn't have any kind of political support. But he still got to the second round uh, as the, 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 the big winner in, in the first round. And now he's uh, in, in the way of winning the elections here in Brazil. Uh, about the populist movement, I, I would say that in Brazil, people uh, have a problem with the populist term. Uh, here in Brazil, popul- populism is uh, uh, is linked with the left, uh, more like the magogery, the, 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 the lies the left t- tells to people. But uh, I get, so, so the populist movement uh, in Brazil, in South America, and also in Europe, and uh, I'd say uh, in the United States, uh, people are looking for, for, for Bolsonaro. So we get, get a lot of messages from people from the Lega Nord in Italy. We get messages from the, the Kurs crowd in Austria. We also get messages from people from UKIP, the Republican Party, the Trump movement. And here in South America, people see Brazil as a huge leader, a regional leader. And so uh, people from Paraguay, Argentina, are expecting Bolsonaro to win so we can face Venezuela, so we can face uh, the globalists, so we can uh, defend our national sovereignties. I I would say that Brazil will try to link uh, the South America populist movement with the American populist movement. We are trying to to connect with Trump and his his people. We, uh, We have had meetings with uh, Beno uh, and people from Breitbart. Uh, we also have had meetings with people from the Laganord, from uh, Kurs and, and, other, uh, and other populist movements around the world. So I believe uh, Brazil will be a large party, uh, a pa- part of what's going on in the world right now. And Bolsonaro will have, uh, will have a special place in the history we, we are write, writing against uh, globalists. Okay, we'll wrap it up there. I mean, just to finish, there's so much enthusiasm. I've never been, seen so much enthusiasm out of a people, out of one particular country than I have with Brazil. Just the sheer volume of messages I get across every single platform, the sheer volume of enthusiasm that pours out of that country. 
you know, yearning for genuine change, and it looks like that's what's going to happen, for better or worse, depending on your standpoint, uh, when Bolsonaro takes victory in this Sunday's election. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I believe uh, this will be a big success in your channel. Uh, as you said, people in Brazil are very enthusiastic, and I would say that comes from our need more than any uh, 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 national character or anything like that. We are happy people, but we are also in need of change here in Brazil. We need to build a conservative movement. We need to build a, an establishment movement. We also need to build an unglobalist movement, and that's going on right now. It, it's very exciting. So thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, listening to me. I, I believe uh, this link between uh, populist movements in Brazil, in the, the Great Britain, and the entire world is very important in this moment. So thank you for, for having me and listen, listening to me.